and hope you had a wonderful afternoon at home and uh, enjoyed the warm weather. Maybe we'll be able to get outside a little bit and uh, just enjoy that. We thank God that you're able to be with us again. In your songbook, please, song number 262, Stand With Me Once You Have It. Song number 262, There's Power in the Blood, number 262. experienced that wonderful power on the front of your bulletin is our verse for this month if you would please say the reference before and after with me first peter 2 21 for even hereunto were ye called because christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps first peter 2 21 let's pray heavenly father thank you so much for this day that you've given us thank you for uh, the morning service and the people and the faithfulness of your church, Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity we have to think about what you did for us this evening, think about what it meant for us, Lord, for our life, for eternity, for just who you came to be, Lord, for us. And we just thank you for opportunities we have to remember uh, your sacrifice that you made as we think about it this evening, Lord. Pray that our hearts and minds will be open to what Pastor has for us. Lord, and that we would just be willing to uh, learn, Lord, again, and to grow each and every day. We thank you for our missionaries around the world who are doing the same, and I pray that you just give them uh, the power as well, Lord, to spread the word that you have given to them to spread wherever they may be, and that you keep them safe, Lord, keep their families safe, and just uh, thank you so much for all you've done for us, and help us to have a, a wonderful service tonight together. In your name, amen. You may be seated. Psalm 247, as we think about what Christ did for us on this first Sunday, let's sing the old rugged cross, number 247. <laughs> Bye. 
Pastor Mark, good singing, good to have each and one of, every one of you here this evening. Glad that you're here. In your bulletin, just a couple of uh, announcements regarding the week to come. Uh, ladies begin their uh, Bible study with uh, Sue Schrader again on Tuesday. Glad to have them back in town, and uh, we are grateful for uh, safety for them. Men's Bible study both Monday and Saturday. Uh, notice the Saturday one is still 8 to 9, but men's breakfast this Saturday will be at 9. So men, uh, you're welcome to join us. We'd love to have you for breakfast and a good challenge from Pastor Mark on Saturday at 9 o'clock. And uh, look forward to uh, our fellowship together. Of course, Wednesday prayer meeting is normal, and we'll look forward to seeing you here. The uh, Junior High uh, Festival, it says it's on Thursday, but it's actually on, on uh, Friday uh, the 8th. Uh, so for those of you who need to know, would like to know, uh, if you want to go down to Rosemont to watch these junior high young people uh, speak and play and sing, and when I say play, their instruments and uh, sing, uh, you're certainly welcome to do so. It's a free event. And uh, so that's going on on Friday down at Rosemont. You pray for the young people and pray for those who are traveling down there and for Miss Herbert who runs all over the building, making sure she's the right place at the right time for whoever she has to play for. And uh, so that'll be a great, a great uh, day as it always is. Uh, congratulations to our Lady Warriors. They took second place at the MAX tournament. They, they, well done, ladies. They, they took, uh, they went to the semifinal with uh, Rosemont and beat Rosemont to get to, yeah, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's always a daunting task and, uh, Coach Porman did a great job with the girls this year, and, and we're grateful for them. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, very good. That was Renata's mom clapping. She's, I think she's pulling for a Most Valuable Player Award uh, from the coach. I don't know, right, Renata? Yeah, she's doing everything she can. But anyways, it was, a, it was a good year, fun year, so congratulations. And our boys took a consolation championship. That's all right. Very good, guys. Uh, they... Won, uh, they won last Monday here to get into the tournament, and then they had a bye to get to the final, and they won on Saturday morning, and so that was exciting as well. So congratulations to all coaches. Uh, Brian Schoonover coaches our men's uh, senior uh, high varsity team, and we are grateful for, for that. Um, let's see. A couple of folks that we really need to keep in prayer. Betty Furry is not doing well. Oxygen levels are low, so pray for Betty if you would tonight. Sharon Underhill still. Um, uh, quite uh, issue with her breathing as well and, and uh, lung capacity. Of course, Pam Strayer recently had a uh, full knee replacement, and uh, she's having a difficult time getting some feeling back into the leg, and the upper part of the leg on which that uh, replacement took place. So just pray for Pam. Uh, pray for uh, the ongoing recovery that she has, and I know she would appreciate that. And then Paul Heil is also in the hospital. Uh, he's in the hospital with uh, some breathing and heart issues, um, and uh, you pray for these folks that uh, recently this weekend have uh, been in the hospital and are uh, recovering, and Betty's not in the hospital, but she is at home, but uh, getting weaker, and so I know Rod would appreciate your prayers for, for Betty as well. Ushers, would you please come as we have an opportunity to give to the work of God this evening, and uh, thank you so much for your faithfulness to the work of God here. I hope that you'll look at the bulletin for some special events coming up around the Easter time, uh, both the Wednesday night before Easter and then Easter Sunday morning. So uh, ask God to help you to be here and invite some folks. Uh, Easter time is one of those times when people might come to church that otherwise they wouldn't. So uh, read the bulletin, find out what's going on, and we'll say more about that as it gets closer. Father, again, we thank you for the opportunity to give to the work of God. We ask your blessing upon this offering. Thank you for each one who so faithfully gives to the work of God so that the ministry might go forward. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Thank you so much for that offertory special. In your songbooks, 264, before we start singing, though, a couple of teen announcements. A um, couple of needs, really, within the teen group. Uh, the 17th of March is our next Aftershock, and we don't have a sponsor for that Aftershock. So if it's something that you thought about doing, but allowed people to sign up first, you know, because you wanted them to have the opportunity, but you really wanted the opportunity to do it, but you're such a servant and such a giver that you were letting someone else do it. Well, here's your opportunity again. It's there for you. Yeah, God brought it back around because he knew you were thinking about it. All right, so if it's something that you would be willing to do, uh, please see me uh, as soon as you can and let me know or send me a text or something saying, hey, we'd be willing to sponsor that Aftershock on the 17th. That would be wonderful. Also, on the 20th, uh, my wife and I will be out of town. That's a Wednesday uh, with a group going down to Iowa from our school um, to compete in uh, larger competitions down there. And the teens that are here are still going to go to the nursing home service. We're going to do the nursing home service on the 20th since the 27th is a, a special Wednesday evening here. So if you are able to drive a bus and you thought here's a need, it would be one of the yellow buses since a white coach bus would be down in Iowa with myself um, and you say hey I could do that for these teens uh, the bus leaves at uh, would leave at 610 so and from 6 and then they'd be back by 8 uh, Todd Frieda will take care of all of it he'll lead it all um, but just if you'd be willing to drive a bus for these uh, teens to go and uh, minister there that would be awesome please see me as well so that we can make sure we have that covered just a couple of things uh, that are in needs we'd love to see somebody fill them so in your songbooks, if you have that, please stand with me, number 264. Stand with me, number 264, the blood of Jesus. As we sing that chorus, mix ensemble, you please come on that chorus. Let's sing the third. The blood of Christ Jesus is God's only way to ransom the sinner. The angels will ring. He came as my Savior.
in your Bible, please, this evening, the Gospel of Mark. Just want to read a portion of Scripture that's very familiar, and then read a lot of other portions of Scripture as we have time here this evening. I'm going to give you 30 seconds, and I want you to think back four years, almost four years, and try to remember where you were on April 5th, 2020. Anybody know? You were at home. Probably in your pajamas still. In your lazy chair. On the couch. Sitting in front of a TV, a computer, an iPad, an iPhone, or whatever electronic device there was in your home, if you had an electronic device and you could access the Facebook or the YouTube, whatever we were doing, this is only three weeks into the shutdown. Remember the shutdown? We were here the second week in March, and then after that, everything shut down, two weeks to March, and, and remember our president at the time said by Easter, we're only a couple of weeks just to Slow the curve. By Easter, you'll all be back together. Well, we weren't. And uh, in fact, it was not until June that we actually began services in public, and we did half. Remember that? Half the auditorium, one hour, half the other hour. No Sunday school, no, no evening service. Wednesday night service was wherever I had the camera. Sunday night was usually in my office. Did that for about six months, and then finally, the following Easter... We actually got together, all of us at one time. I bring all that up because the message I'm going to bring this evening is the message I preached on that Sunday morning, April 5th, while you were at home. And I preached here to maybe two or three people manning the camera and someone doing the sound. And uh, (laughs) I asked my wife this. I said, I'm going to, where were you? Oh, I don't know. And so I said, you were at home. Oh, yeah. Those were good days. (laughs) <laughs> she didn't say it like that but that's what I interpreted it you know how, how they say something and it's not really what they meant but that's what you heard that's what I heard oh I remember those days those are really good days and maybe it was about the Sunday night service oh yeah I remember that that was nice but anyways we were here Mark and Ann were here and a few uh, special music people that would rotate remember those days it seemed like it was an eternity ago and yet it seems like just yesterday but I'm sure glad it's not today And uh, praise God, we can be together. And so this evening, uh, in in light of our Lord's Supper, maybe those of you who heard this message online four years ago almost, will have written it down somewhere and maybe lost your notes, but maybe you'll remember some of it. We're just going to take the word cross this evening, and that's going to be our outline for the wonderful truth of the cross of Christ as we consider the communion table this evening. Here's Mark's chapter 15. Mark chapter 15, here is his account, beginning at verse 15, Mark 15, 15, and so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole band. And they clothed him with purple and plaited a crown of thorns and put it about his head. And began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him on the head with a reed, and did spit upon him, and bowing their knees, worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him, and, and put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. And they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And they bring him unto the place Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of a skull. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. Obviously, when we think of the cross, the letter C simply stands for crucifixion. It wasn't just any death. It was 
a crucifixion. Matthew 27, Mark 15, right here, Luke 23, John 19. This word crucified or crucified is found more than almost a dozen times in all of these accounts regarding the death of Jesus Christ by way of crucifixion. And of course, the Roman death penalty by crucifixion was indeed one of the most barbaric, gruesome, painful ways to die. The majority of crucifixions, the victim was tied to a cross which prolonged the agony of death. The one hanging on that tree with arms outstretched and knees slightly bent would eventually die of suffocation. Unable to pull himself up in order to breathe, the person would eventually expire sometimes after a day or more of hanging on the cross. Jesus' crucifixion, however, was different. It was unusual in the sense that he died of suffocation and extreme blood loss. The crown of thorns on his head, the beatings on his back that laid his body bruised and torn and open. The spear in his side and of course the nails driven through his hands and feet. The Savior died after only a few agonizing hours on the cross. That's why Pilate marveled in Mark chapter 15, just down a few more verses, that he was already dead. It was unusual. In fact, some were on the cross for so long that they would actually break their legs so that they couldn't lift up any longer. They didn't have to break Jesus' legs. Of course, that's prophetic. Not a bone of him was broken. But he was already died. Isaiah 53, 5 says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. The cross was a place of horrific crucifixion. Romans chapter 3, let's look at the R. The R stands for redemption. Romans chapter 3, please. Romans three twenty four. being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. The word is satisfaction through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Talking about uh, two verses full of theology. Notice you got justified freely, redemption that's in Christ Jesus, propitiation through faith, the remission of sins. What a great couple of verses that help us to understand that the cross was a place of redemption. Redemption. Redemption is only possible as we put his faith, uh, our faith in his blood his work on the cross. This word redemption is a great word. It means to to deliver by paying a price. To deliver by paying a price. We are delivered from the penalty of sin. We are delivered from eternity in hell. We are delivered from being separated from God forever. Why? Because Jesus paid the price by his death on the cross. Now there are three Greek words. We've shared this in the past somewhere along the line to help us understand this matter of redemption. There's a Greek word called Agarazzo, which means to purchase in the market. What market? Well, Paul says in Romans chapter 7 and verse 15 that we were sold under sin. We were, as it were, in a marketplace. And that marketplace was the marketplace of sin and the marketplace of death. We were sold there before Jesus saved us. We were in the marketplace under the condemnation of sin and death. But Agarazzo, Jesus Christ paid our purchase in the market. But there's another word. And you put the little X in front of it, X agarazzo, which means to buy out of the market. We were in the market and we were purchased and we are purchased to come out of the marketplace of sin. To be redeemed then from the marketplace of sin and death is by payment of a price. And the purchase price was the blood of the redeemer. And by the way, once the price has been paid, That sinner is redeemed, and that sinner is never again exposed for sale. God saves us, and God keeps us saved. But there's another Greek word that helps us understand this idea of being redeemed, and that is lutro. Lutro, it simply means to loose, to make free, to set at liberty. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 32, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Lutro. And then verse 36 says, if the Son therefore shall make you free, Lutro, you shall be free indeed. That's what redemption is all about. Being purchased with a price, the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross. 
to buy us out of the slave market of sin and death and eternal damnation to the freedom and liberty that we have in Christ. No more a slave to sin, but a servant of God, a child of God, an heir of Jesus Christ. The shackles of sin that once bound us to our habits and to our addictions and to our own self-pleasure and way of living that only enslaved us further, really, we can be free. These things can be freeing. We can be loosed by the precious blood of Christ, free from sin, free from the fear of death, free from Satan's grasp on our life, and we are at liberty now to serve a new master. His name is Jesus, a loving and compliant kind and compassionate master who only does what is best for us. Oh, thank God for the redemption that we have that was provided by the cross of Calvary. That brings us to the letter O. Would you turn to Philippians chapter 2, please? Philippians chapter 2. Again, these are familiar verses, but let's concentrate on the wonderful work on the cross that Jesus went through for you and for me. Philippians 2, 5. Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Obedient unto death. Consider with me the last few hours of Jesus' life. He and his disciples are alone in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Lord willing, this Sunday as we are preaching about events surrounding the cross, I think we're going to talk about the agony in the garden. And he knows his hour is coming. He knows the pain and suffering that he is soon to experience. And he is alone with the Father. And Jesus falls on his face and he prays in Matthew 26, verse 39, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but thou, thy will be done. Now, let us not think and let us put away from our mind any thought that Jesus was unwilling to die when he said, let this cup pass from me. No, he knew he came to die. The cup that he refers to is not only the, the suffering that crucifixion brings. But listen, Jesus knew that in his death, he was taking on the sins of the whole world for all time. And in doing so, the Father was going to hide his face from him. And the eternal fellowship of the Father and Son would be broken as the wrath of God was placed on his Son. And I think Jesus is saying, is there any other way that we can do this where our fellowship won't be broken? Jesus knew what he was about to face. The perfect, righteous, sinless man was supposed to, was going to take on your sins. And if it wasn't, if it was your sins only, that'd be enough. It was my sins and only, that'd be enough. But it was the sins of every one of us. And Jesus said, it's a tough, difficult cup, but it's not what I want. It's what God wills. He was obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 5. We see this same truth in Hebrews chapter 5. Wonderful, wonderful passages of Scripture. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. How could it be said that the Son of God learned anything? He's God. <laughs> how, how does he learn anything? Doesn't he know it all? Isn't he omniscient? Certainly. But as a son, as a God-man, we understand that he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. That is, his entrance into this world as a man involved him in experiences that he had never would have known had he stayed in heaven. Each morning, his ear was open to receive instructions from his father for that day. He learned experimentally as the 
son who was always subject to his father's will. And he said that throughout his ministry, I have come not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And because of his obedience, we read here in he, uh, Hebrews chapter 5, he became the author. He became a perfect savior. And the fact of the matter is, he could never have become our perfect savior if he had remained in heaven. But through his incarnation, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension, he completed the work that was necessary to save us from our sins. And now he is, has the acquired glory of being the perfect savior of the world. The author of eternal salvation, the source, the originator, the planner, we might say. The cross, by the way, the cross was not an afterthought. Oh, no. Adam and Eve sinned. Wasn't expecting that. Now what? From eternity past, the cross was planned. God knew what was going to happen in the garden that day. And God planned the salvation of the world. The son performed it there on the cross of Calvary. The cross was in the mind of the father from the foundation of the world. And his son obediently fulfilled the father's will as he went to the cross to die for your sins and mine. Now, I think this is an interesting verse here because maybe someone will come along and say, oh, so I can be saved simply by obeying him. If I just obey God, if I just obey his word, I'll go to heaven. I'm going to obey the Ten Commandments and go to heaven. Is that what is being taught here? Well, let's look at a couple of verses that will help us understand that. Turn to Romans chapter 1 and Romans 16. Because at the beginning of Romans and the end of Romans, we find the Apostle Paul talking about this obedience. What are we talking about? What does it mean that he died? He's the author of eternal salvation to all that obey him. Romans chapter 1 verse 5. Romans 1 5. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for, here it is, obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Obedience for the faith, to the faith. Romans 16, he closes the same way, verse 25, Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. So what does it mean to obey him? And what it means to obey him is to listen to Acts chapter 17 and verse 30, where, uh, G, uh, where Paul is speaking. Uh, they're in Athens on Mars Hill, and, and it says that God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. That's the command that needs to be obeyed if there's going to be salvation. And Jesus Christ came to the earth to die on the cross, and he commands all men to be saved. We are to obey that command. You see, obedience led Jesus to the cross. Obedience leads us to the Savior. Obedience. Have you obeyed him? Do you know him as your Savior? Well, let's look at the letter S. The first one is sacrifice. Sacrifice. Of course, we know that great passage in Genesis chapter 22 where Abraham is asked to sacrifice his son Isaac and, and they're going up the mountain and, and Isaac says, Dad, we have the wood, we have the fire, where, where's the lamb? And, 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 and Abraham answers, God will provide himself a lamb. The altar is built and, and Isaac gets on, on, the, on the altar and, 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 and Abraham raises the knife to plunge it into his son. I just can't even fathom, first of all, what's going through dad's mind and what's going through Isaac's mind he was probably old enough to be able to get off the altar old enough to argue there's nothing in scripture that says but he just simply believed what dad said that God's going to provide a lamb and sure enough before Isaac was killed there was a lamb over in the bush and they sacrificed that lamb and God said okay Abraham I know that you're willing to with not even withhold your only son and of course, God will provide himself a lamb when Jesus Christ came to this world to be the sacrifice, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Hebrews chapter 9, quickly please. Hebrews chapter 9. Just went through the book of Hebrews in my Bible class in, in school and, and uh, didn't spend a lot of time on it, but we hit a lot of highlights and this is a great 
passage of scripture that lets us know that the new covenant is better than the old covenant. And if you want to know anything about Hebrews, ask Renata. Anybody else that's in my Bible class because they've got it down straight now. Notice uh, verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 25, sorry. Hebrews 9, 25, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he have often suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice. There's our word, sacrifice of himself. Turn to chapter 10 and verse number 11. There are 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering sometimes the same sacrifice, oftentimes the same sacrifice, which can never take away sin. But this man, talking about Jesus Christ in verse 10, this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. My dear Catholic friend, we don't need any sacrifices any longer. The Mass is contrary to the Word of God. Christ is not being sacrificed over and over again. Once in the end of the world. This man Jesus, no priest, no prophet, no pastor has the authority to take away sin. Salvation is only through the man, God-man, Jesus Christ. And if anyone depends on their church or, or their denomination or their good works or anything else for the forgiveness of sins, you must repent of that thinking. You must repent to change your mind, to turn from your way of how to get to heaven and understand God and his way and how to get to heaven. You and I deserve to die and go to hell because of our sin. But Jesus was our sacrifice, dying on the cross, and finally, the last S is the word satisfaction. Isaiah 53, 11 says, He, the Father, shall see the travail of his soul, his being the Son, and shall be satisfied. Imagine that. This word travail means trouble and sorrow and grievance. And God the Father was satisfied by his Son's death on Calvary. He was satisfied knowing that what his son had accomplished would provide the way for man to be reconciled with God. He was satisfied in knowing that man would be saved and justified as they accepted Christ's death on the cross as payment for their sin. The redemptive act gave great satisfaction to God. Humanly speaking, we see the cross as a horrific death of an innocent man. But from heaven's perspective... The cross was where God was satisfied as Jesus paid the price. He met the demands of a perfect sacrifice for the atonement of sin, even as we mentioned the atonement this morning. Paul David Tripp, who is a great author, uh, well-written author, said this, The cross is evidence that in the hands of the Redeemer, moments of apparent defeat become wonderful moments of grace and clarity. The cross to human beings think, oh, how horrible to God. How wonderful, how satisfactory that is to me to see my son obedient to the death. Even though it meant separation because of his sin, Jesus Christ has met the demands of the law. And so he said, it is finished. Everything he had come to earth to do, the purpose for which he came was to die for man, and everything he did was done. It was complete. It, it's finished. Now, he still had more to do, even as we talked at lunch today. He still had to come out of the grave, did he not? He still had to live for 40 days to, to meet with his disciples to give evidence that he had indeed risen from the dead. But when it came to redemptive work, it was over. There's nothing more that needed to be done. So what satisfies the Father today? Well, certainly I believe that when a person acknowledges their sin and they confess their sin and, and seek the mercy and forgiveness of God through Jesus Christ and, and calls upon the name of the Lord to be saved, that brings satisfaction. For we read in, in Luke 15, 10, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God when one sinner repents. When you got saved, the angels rejoiced. Are you helping the angels rejoice today as we share this wonderful faith with others. And we share the redemptive work of Jesus Christ on the cross with others. I think 
It's also very satisfactory to the father when he sees his children living in the light. No longer living in the darkness, in the, in the, in the marketplace of sin. Oh, we've been saved out of it, but unfortunately sometimes our old flesh gets the better of us and we, we kind of go back to living that way. Oh, I think it satisfies the father very much when he sees his children living in the light of Calvary. In the light of their redeemed soul. We've been delivered from the bondage of sin. Let us not once again live according to the flesh. Christ has served us, or saved us to serve him. In 2005, or excuse me, 2020, I closed that message by saying this. We are living in unusual days. COVID-19 pandemic is a serious matter as tens of thousands have been inflicted and thousands have died. There is, however, a pandemic worse than the coronavirus. It's the pandemic of sin. It is worse because everyone born in this world has been affected and because one day everyone will die because of it. As men and women race to find a cure for COVID-19. Now, from this side of COVID-19, a little frustrating to know that some things that they did could have been done better. The whole shutdown thing I don't think was necessary, but too late to cry over spilled milk. But I said at that time, I pray that they will find a cure very soon. However, a cure has already been provided for the pandemic of sin. It's the blood of Jesus Christ which cleanses us from all sin. His death on the cross provides redemption for any and all who will trust him. But you have to come to the cross. You have to come to the cross. In fact, let's stand in, in your songbooks, 242. Uh, Debbie, to come to the piano, please. Deacons who are serving this evening, you may be dismissed and prepare for the communion service. 242, please. Let's sing that song, Come to the Cross Upon Calvary. Gaze on this scene anew. 242, let's sing a verse or two as the deacons prepare for the communion service. Look to the cross of the Lamb of God, lay all your guilt on Him. Freely His lifeblood He sacrificed, paying the debt of your sin.